I am here to introduce Jessamine West. Um, many of you may be aware of her because she has that librarian.net blog. She kind of grabbed that URL, what, 1999. So she's had that for a very long time, one of the first librarians to blog. She's the author of Without a Net, Librarians Bridging the Digital Divide. This is in the Knuckles Collection, and I would highly recommend you read this book because it tells how librarians are working with our patrons and tells the story. There's some Kansas stuff in here. The Kansas Libraries on the Web Project is featured. Lots of other things, but we brought in Jessamine um, originally to talk about the bridging, the digital divide, but then with some of the work she's doing and has started doing um, the presentation turned into open libraries, and I think she's got a lot of great information to share. So thanks, Jessamine. Thanks. Let me know if you guys can't hear me in the back. Um, everything I'm going to talk about has links to stuff on the web. Uh, like Cindy, Cynthia, I talk really fast and I talk about a lot of different things. And what I'd like is for people to just be aware of what the stuff is. If there's specific items you want to dig more into, librarian.net slash talks, T A L K S slash. Neckles. And you guys say neckles, right? Not necklace or <laughs> somebody asked and I was like, I don't know, I just read it on the internet. Um, but it also includes um, my slides that have all my notes in a variety of formats. So if you want to follow along or you want to go check out the art exhibit, which is really nice in the back uh, and catch up later, that's super. But like Heather said, my plan originally was to talk about the digital divide, which is a project near and dear to my heart, or the, a topic near and dear to my heart, and one that I'll basically talk about anyhow, um, whether people want me to or not. People are like, oh, the libraries and everything on the internet. I'm like, oh, you are in for a treat. So, but this year, and I'll sort of start with the slides, this year has um, changed a bunch of things. That's the URL again. Um, changed a bunch of things in the library world in ways that are kind of a big deal. And uh, one of my favorite things about being a librarian is it's a very exciting job that other people don't think is very exciting. And so I'm going to talk about some of the things that I think make it really exciting and some of the things that I've been doing this year that I think may be exciting to you. So we'll see. Uh, moving on. Um, I have a bunch of different jobs, and one of them is only just barely working in a public library. I live in a small town in the middle of Vermont with about 4,500 people. I'm the intrepid part-timer at my library, which means when somebody's out sick, I live walking distance from the library, and I go fill in, and everybody's like, who are you? And I'm like, I've lived in this town for seven years. Um, but I mostly fill in there. What I mostly do in my town is I teach people how to use computers. We have a drop-in time. Five hours a week, I sit in an open lab, and anybody in town who has problems with computers, they just come in and ask. Sometimes we help them, sometimes we tell them they actually need professional help, sometimes we tell them to go to their library. Well, like we've got computer guys in town, right? But sometimes you need to know, is this a problem I actually need to pay a guy for, or can you type some stuff and fix it? Um, I work for metafilter.com, which is a massive group blog. There's a couple people from Metafilter here. It's just a discussion forum on the web. People talk about stuff. We have a questions and answers part of the site where people can ask questions, receive answers in a very informal, uh, hive mind kind of way. If you're more curious about that, uh, look me up, free accounts for librarians. <coughs> Um, I volunteer email support at Open Library. If you don't know what Open Library is, I will be talking more about that. And I've got a blog and I write stuff and I go and talk to people about my blogging and writing other stuff. So, hey. Um, so I always go Googling around to find public domain images that I can use for these talks so that anybody who wants to repurpose my talks is not going to wind up going to jail for copyright violations that we're all worried about. And so, you know, I Google exciting librarian, which is a terrible thing to do with safe search off, and found <laughs> a bunch of stuff in a training manual. This is a library training manual from 1921. It's linked on my list of links. You can find it in Open Library. You can probably see it, but it says Ideal Home Traveling Library. And the caption that was under this in the book was, I don't remember, something, something, you know, Bookmobile, but the, the quote was, someday this hamlet will have its own permanent structure. Which I was like, hey, way to go, you know. 
And yet, now that when we're talking about libraries of the future, we're talking less and less about new permanent structures, and we're talking more and more about the cloud, virtual services, 24-7, this, that, and the other. And don't get me wrong, I love the permanent structures. I'm just saying that when we're envisioning the future, it's less and less of what we were thinking about, and only 80, 90 years ago, that was the dream. So, like I said, exciting. Um, and so, you know, you talk about pop-up stuff and, and things that have less and less permanence, and for enduring institutions, that becomes a very challenging um, chasm. But at any rate, I'm excited to be a librarian, partly because I'm excitable, but also because <laughs> library culture over the last year, even, a whole bunch of stuff has happened, which I'm going to sort of talk about and do a little bit of a recap. Uh, looking at what's been happening in the last calendar year, <coughs> Wikimedia Commons, interested in Braille calendars in Czech? You can use those pictures to do whatever you want, including segues into calendar and stuff. So, a couple slides that are just talking about what I'm talking about when I talk about this past year. A couple lawsuit type things and things that, yeah, I like to say kind of went our way. So, May 2012, Georgia. Georgia State won, or they mostly won, the lawsuit about e-reserves. If you're not familiar with this, they were putting lots and lots and lots of stuff online for kids to check out, and um, publishers said, you know, that's not fair use. You're just stealing from us. We're going broke. We can't feed our children. And <laughs> I don't know why you hate publishing. And it turned into this drama, drama, drama thing. Um, and Georgia State mostly won, but especially they mostly won by people saying, no, this is really exactly what fair use actually is, is letting kids study stuff that you wrote. It, that's what educational means in school, et cetera. And uh, there was some really funny uh, sort of snark on the internet. Uh, Brandon Butler, who's from ARL, Association of Research Libraries, uh, his quotation was, Oxford Union University Press reported a billion dollars in sales last year. 180 million of that was profits. Is that what a publisher on the verge of collapse looks like? <laughs> And uh, Oxford University Press is appealing this year, and uh, they're unlikely to win. But it was interesting, and, and don't get me wrong, I love publishers, I just want them to work with us to be reasonable. This, this is not me being like, eh, publishers, at all. So, um, Journals of the Modern Language Association, this was in June of 2012. Um, they changed their author agreements to leave copyright for all of the MLA journals in the hands of the authors and allow them to share them in digital repositories. <coughs> Small change, didn't really even make that much of a ripple, but it's kind of a big deal because the Modern Language Association is kind of giant, and they're deciding it's time for them to walk the talk. Oh, we want to be more reasonable about copyright, or we want publishers and writers and everyone else to be more reasonable? Let's see how open access destroys our business. You know, hint, it probably actually doesn't. Okay, moving on. Basically, they're saying, hey, if you value the culture, the culture now includes sharing. Oh, and we're the Modern Language Association. Um, October 2012, this was the big deal. Um, Authors Guild, again, I love authors. I want them to be happy, but this was a problematic lawsuit where they went after Hockey Trust. If you're not familiar with Hockey Trust, it's a giant um, compendium of uh, digitally available documents that uses sort of various levels of access depending on what your institutional affiliation was, but a lot of the Google scanned stuff winds up indexed and keyword searchable in Hockey Trust, which I think doesn't have a th in it. So I don't know how to pronounce anything, basically. So the decision made um, was also these uses, making it searchable, making it indexable, making it available to print disabled users was all determined to be fair use under the US copyright law. The, distinct, the decision specifically mentioned transformative uses, like making an index. So you can't even get at all the documents if you're just some schmo like me who doesn't have an, education, an institutional affiliation, but you can use a keyword index. You've probably seen it on Google with the snippet view and stuff like that. Hockey Trust is a larger version of this, but basically they're like, it's totally okay for people to index your copyrighted stuff. Sorry, you know. And uh, there was sort of more stuff, and it also paved the way for other digital repositories to do similar things, because now there's a legal decision that says, we actually think this is maybe kind of 
okay. And the thing about hockey that's so appealing from a rights holder perspective is that they're really good at the access control thing. Like, I don't know about your libraries, but some of the libraries I'm in, we have kind of these databases and they're behind a password wall and you're supposed to type in your password or your library card number. But really, if you ever had a library card at that library, that will work to get into these uh, database uh, online databases forever, because all it's doing is matching a pattern of the numbers on your library card. You guys are all more sophisticated than we are in Vermont, aren't you? Because I've been able to get into databases I have no right to be able to get into because I have the pattern for the library card number of the town. Hockey does better than this, and they have sophisticated levels of access control. They do proxy pass-through stuff so that you uh, authenticate at your own individual university, and so there's serious business about not having hackable URLs where people can get at the stuff. The password is part of what they provide. Um, so some users get access, other users get different access, and all the stuff is behind the password at some level or another. Uh, UCLA streaming. Um, this was in November 2012, the Association for Information, Media, and Equipment not an organization I knew a lot about. Um, they had a lawsuit against UCLA who was streaming copyrighted content behind password walls for students through like a Moodle-like environment. So courseware, within courseware. Uh, not only was this lawsuit dismissed, you see my little circle, it was dismissed with prejudice. And with prejudice means quit asking. So it looks like that's probably not going to also go anywhere, which opens the door for more educational institutions to stream content to students because there's now firm decisions saying, at least in these cases, if your case is like this case, we think this is legal, which is also sort of important. They talked a little bit about um, other discussion about whether a streaming copy actually fixes um, a piece of content in a new way, which was an interesting nuance to copyright, and a lot of this is kind of above my head, legal, legal, legal stuff. But, you know, we won is something I do, uh, I do understand. <laughs> and it's also an access issue, similar to Hockey Trust, because this all happened inside the content management system, wasn't available on the live web, and there was a sophisticated password system that decided what was and was not okay. Uh, this was probably my favorite one of all of them. It's hard to pick a favorite, right? Um, but this was February 2013, in response to a We the People petition. You know that thing the government does where they're like, make this list, you only have to get 25,000 people. Oh, you're all making lists about legalizing marijuana. Let's make it 50,000 people. Um, but now it's 50,000 people, and people are still getting their petitions heard. And this was a We the People petition. It got 60,000 signatures. Federal agencies with more than a hundred million in research and development expenditures. So we're talking big, big guys here. Um, have to develop plans to make the results of the publicly funded research available to the public uh, in a year, 12 months. So for a lot of people, they're like 12 months. You can make all the money you want to make in 12 months. We've all heard about the long tail. How much money are you really making way out here? And how much does the public actually deserve the stuff they paid for from you, the government? court said, yeah, right. And so it's not just hippies like me, it's people like the government who really feel like this is a good idea. So that's gratifying in its own way because it's happening at high levels from people you've heard of. As much as I love my library, me making a stand about, I'm going to show Jaws and I'm going to use the title of the movie in the newspaper, isn't really going to make big ripples with the copyright people, but stuff like this actually does. Um, this was getting talked about in October, but the decision was in March. Uh, Kurt saying another word I'm not sure I can pronounce versus Wiley. Wiley, who you've heard about. Um, basically, this was a lot about first sale. If you guys don't know about Kurt saying, he's a dude in America who went and bought cheaper versions of textbooks in other countries and then sold them in this country. Cheaper textbooks, brought them here, sold them, made money. Wiley was like, that's totally against the rules. That's our money to make. Kurt Zang was like, no, it's not. And then they fought. And then uh, Kurt Zang actually went. And a lot of people were really worried. Libraries were really worried. Because this is a first sale thing. You bought it. You own it, right? Like, that's a thing we get. If we're the library, we bought it. We get to put it in the book sale. We get to 
make an exhibit out of it. We get to lend it to people, which is really important, um, and a whole bunch of other stuff. So people were wringing their hands and like, it's the end of first sale. Other people were like, ah, it's the end of us being able to make any money starving children. Ultimately, Wiley is still in business, and this decision did not go their way, which I think is okay. So, bam, first sale, continually upheld, makes us happy. Things are going pretty well. A couple sort of funny things that have happened fairly recently. Um, you guys know the MPAA, right? Motion Picture Association. American A? The other A? American. Association. America. America. Okay, great. Um, <laughs> I just know they're the people who told me I couldn't see movies when I was little, and now I'm like, what was all the fuss about? But, <laughs> but they're the people who tell you that you can't say we're showing Jaws in the newspaper. They say that you can show you know, a scary movie about a shark on Martha's Vineyard and hope your patrons can clue in to what it actually is because of reasons. So even the MPA has been acting kind of weird. They basically sided with the Authors Guild to, there was the, you know, a digitizing, part of Google's digitizing thing. They went after universities and Google and their fair use activities, being like, grump, 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 this is gonna be the end of everything for the MPAA, grump. And so we were like, well, that's what they do for a job. But then, this very funny story, the Ravens, I hear they're a popular football team in America, and they had a logo their, one of their original logos was kind of designed by a fan. And all the fan wanted was like a football helmet and like some tickets to the game. And the Ravens were like, maybe, but we're gonna put it on our jerseys anyhow, but then rah. And so they wound up fighting about that. Ravens changed their logo, super. But every now and again, there's promotional stuff, old Ravens stuff that shows up with the old Ravens logo on it. And the dude who designed it and didn't get paid or a helmet or anything gets kind of mad. Long story slightly shorter, the MPA was suddenly like, that dude's gonna get mad at us. Or other people could get mad at us, movie makers, basically putting non-copyrighted images in our movies. <laughs> we could be in some huge trouble. If, if this was true. And so all of a sudden there were like, it's fair use. The MPAA says, it's fair use. And so now you've got to believe there's something in the water, right? Because when the MPAA is starting to argue fair use as a defense for you know, their own stuff, we're suddenly, we're suddenly feeling that, that maybe this is the sea change we've been looking for. So the MPAA, this is a funny article actually talking about MPA suddenly in support of fair use for no reason. And then, um, is that me? Um, and then recently, uh, very recently, uh, April 18th, so last week, uh, Viacom, another giant mega corporation that you've probably heard of, and then YouTube, another giant mega corporation that you possibly, this is so hard for me, right? Like, do I want the mega corporation on the left and the mega corporation on the right to win? But basically, Viacom came out and lost their suit against, or, <laughs> Yeah, they, the, the higher court rejected Viacom's attempts to sue Google for the immense copyright violations that we all know happen there. But basically they have a long legal argument that I recommend reading if you're into that kind of thing, where Google's like, look, we try to take it down when you tell us to take it down. It's not really that cool of you to have robots telling us to take down stuff that's not copyright violations just because your children are hungry. And let's talk about this like two giant mega corporations. So Viacom's um, suit was upheld, which is good news for all of the sharing people on the internet who would like to do this and not worry about robots that are like, I think I heard three seconds of a Beyonce song in that video, so now you can't use YouTube anymore. Which I think is a thing a lot of us are worried about. So. Um, so there's a lot of agitating about fair use specifically. This is a great thing if you haven't seen it. It's linked on the list. It's an ALA, kind of help you make a fair use evaluation. Obviously, the only thing you can really use to make a fair use evaluation is winning a lawsuit in the courts. But there's a lot of very good 
best guesses you can do, and I'll talk sort of briefly about it, but I really feel like this year is the tipping point, which is why it's very exciting. So um, ARL has a very nice collection of slides. They did a um, fair use guidelines for academic and research libraries, which realistically other people can use and adapt. But they got money from, I don't know, Sloan and Mallet and a whole bunch of people. They made a big set of best practices for fair use. They've made it available on their website. And they're going on like dog and pony shows with slides. This is a slide of a slide. Basically talking about sort of why it's important. And their main point is it enables our mission. It is our mission. So serving knowledge, we have to access copyrighted work. Sorry, it's true. And um, the fact that the world of technology changes means that we have to be able to shift that stuff into other formats, into other places, and archive it and preserve it for the future. I don't know why I'm even telling you guys this. You all know it. But ARL knows it, and they're going on the road sort of talking about that. So as more and more of this content is digitized, you could just insert my entire hobby horse about the digital divide here. A lot of what we're talking about now is access, who's got the passwords and how they can get to it, and equity of access. Can everybody who has access get to it? So um, very recent libraries give us stuff like the Digital Public Library of America, which was going to have a fancy launch in Boston last week, and instead had a soft launch online, which is worth clicking around, and it's fairly interesting. I like the idea of the Digital Public Library. I like the people who work on it. I think their heart is in the right place. Um, but in many ways, the Digital Public Library of America is a library for libraries. It's kind of a discovery layer for vast access of content. And the one thing they don't do, which they, which my dream of the Digital Public Library of America would have done, is allow me to search by rights. Like I want to search the free stuff that I have access to, and it's that's not as serviceable. I mean, you can tell priorities by what people put on the main page, right? There's an awesome map. There's an awesome timeline. None of that stuff loads on my, you know, pokey phone connection in Vermont. It's beautiful, but I want to search by rights, and I can't which is too bad. So then there's open library. Now, uh, in the wake of the terrible stuff that happened to Aaron Schwartz, there's a whole bunch of people who have stepped up and said, you know, we've got to sort of continue his legacy. People talk about Aaron's army or whatever. But he helped build a lot of really cool things and had his heart in a place that I think a lot of us would like to be in. And I love all my jobs. But I thought what I really needed to do is have a project that was library-ish and that was free and open access-ish. And so I basically contacted Open Library, which is a product, uh, project that Aaron helped build at the Internet Archive. Internet Archive, you've probably heard about. They have tons and tons and tons of stuff online, but the website's kind of hard to use and complicated, and the search doesn't work like you'd like it to. So everybody thinks it's, you know, everybody loves it because they mirror what they dream about onto it because it feels like it's not maybe quite there yet which is fine. Um, so I don't know how much you know about the Open Library, but I know some people there, and I contacted them. And I'll talk a little bit about what they actually do, in case you don't, uh, if you know exactly what they do, you can check your email for a couple minutes. Um, but basically, the Open Library allows, in addition to the other stuff they do, lending of e-books. You know, e-books, like you guys lend. Only they do it slightly differently, and I'll talk a little bit about it. And to anyone in the United States. I think even more than the United States, but I can guarantee the United States. So you can read a book online with a single <laughs> click. And when I say a single click, I mean like one click, not like overdrive inflated for you know advertising single click. Like you click a thing, you're reading a book about port lines. It's awesome. You can borrow books with a couple more clicks. I'll draw your attention to the red circles, but I'll also draw your attention to the far red circle. So you can borrow this book from uh, Open Library. And I know what you're thinking. And, and you don't have to pay or anything. It's free, free life, beer, speech, and all the other free things you like, kittens. Um, but this book is published in 1993. And I know what you're thinking. Like copyright, I don't remember if it's 1927 or 1926, but I know 1993 is definitely in copyright. 
So what's the deal? How does this work? That is not legal, is it? And so basically the way Open Library functions is they have partner libraries. Partner libraries like you've heard about, like the Boston Public Library. Anybody here a partner library with thinking about it? Um, so Boston Public Library, for instance, has a book about porcupines. It doesn't really serve, it's a kid's book from 20 years ago. They take the book, scan it, Internet Archive has scanners all over the place. They put it on the shelf, and they don't circ the physical copy of the book. They take the digital copy, they upload it to the Internet Archive, they wrap it in a little bit of Adobe digital rights management stuff, and again, topic for another day, complicated. So that they circ one copy of this book at a time, and instead of circing it to anyone in Massachusetts, they circ it to anyone in the world. And, you know, I saw them talk about it at Massachusetts Library Association Conference, and I was like, is that legal? And they're like, our lawyers think it is. <laughs> <laughs> and we have lawyers. So, let's see. And in the meantime, it chugs along loaning e-books to people. And, and mostly, I was talking a little bit about this at dinner last night, in many ways it's a ghost ship because there's not really anyone running it for the most part. Um, there's not like a collection development person. They just get what they get, and it's fairly random. And, um, well, I'll talk more about that in a second. So, um, you can library in there. Uh, the items at Open Library have mark records available. If you need to like pick up a mark record or two, or a couple million, there's an API and you can get mark from the Open Library and you can just have it. Because some libraries have decided to just share their mark records. Is that legal? Probably? We don't know. We've got a decent working relationship with OCLC. So it's not, we're not doing it in secret. I'm not telling you like, and don't tell anybody. Like, it's, anyone can see this on the internet. So mark records, you can have those. Um, interacting with people. So a lot of people are like, oh, that's cute, Jessamine, your little website, yeah, you and your six friends, check out ebooks, you're pirates. I'm like, no, seriously, we're signing up 700 new users a day. A, a day? Um, you, people have made a million lists. We've circulated 67,000 ebooks. We've got 18,000 new members in the last 30 days. 28 days, sorry. So it's, it's popular. Um, but then the big question is, <coughs> yeah, that's great. How many librarians work there? And the answer is kind of none. <laughs> or the answer is kind of 100, because it's a wiki, and so anyone can edit it, and la, la, la. And, one of the things that I found when I started doing support there, which was probably in February, I probably answered a thousand emails helping people use things, is that there's no one running the thing. Rooster, who actually heads the entire Internet Archive, kind of runs this. But they had a project manager, they got a grant, and then I don't know what happened. People left, there's allegations that, who knows, they're Internet people, they fight. So, but there's nobody kind of in charge. There's mailing lists, there's a community, there's a wiki, and you can edit most of the stuff on the site, but not all of it, which is interesting to me because, of course, I want to edit the one page. I'm not allowed to edit. Um, but basically, a lot of the stuff is happening either on a volunteer basis or other places in the Internet Archive. Scanning happens through the book projects. The dev stuff happens on the same server. And when I signed up in February, no one had actually answered a support email in six weeks kind of a secret. That might be kind of a secret. Because I love it there, so I don't want to be like, ah, rah, rah. But honestly, there's a lot of these things that, you know, the tech part kind of operates like it operates until it doesn't operate. And all the emails I'm getting, I, I love the Google Translate phone app. You know, we get emails in Portuguese, we get emails in Spanish, we get emails in Chinese, we get emails in um, Afrikaans, we get emails in all these languages. I use Google Translate, I write back, and I send a translated version in my English version. A lot of times what they're asking is, do you have books in Afrikaans? Do you have books in Portuguese? And the answer actually is, yeah, we totally do. But it's not so easy to find, and you have to kind of explain to people how to do it. Or you get people who can't log in. Or you get people who are having digital rights management problems. It's like the funny joke of my life, that I'm like this total copy fighter, and I spend a lot of time now telling people, Okay, you've got to like now reinstall and reauthorize it with your password, and then, you know, and the, and the Linux true believers are like, I can't believe you even support this. And we're like, well, we try not to make the perfect the enemy of the good. But it's a challenge because figuring out just how imperfect 
things can get before they're actually bad is what I spend a lot of my uh, late nights talking about. So a couple other statistics. We get about 40 to 50 emails a day. So it's not that many. I mean, I answer them usually when I'm working at Metafilter or just when I'm hanging out. They're not all like super challenging. Um, but often they're about the same small set of things. And a lot of the people are people I recognize. They're not so good with email. They're not so good with computers. They downloaded a book and they don't know where it is. Like normal stuff that you've heard about. And so the project is awesome, but the reality is there's still human beings who still need to learn how to use the project. And I sort of feel like in that situation, and probably in many other situations, we could be doing better, I guess. And I think if we're trying to make ebooks real to people, uh, we have to kind of do, know a few things. So like Wikipedia is always the example. Like Wikipedia is the encyclopedia that anybody can edit. But as much as you can edit Wikipedia, you can't edit the structure of Wikipedia. Someone's got the passwords, and that someone isn't you. And it's not me. <coughs> if I decide I want Wikipedia to look different, I can maybe style it with a script or style it with something else. But anyone can't totally edit Wikipedia. And then you read those articles, right, where it turns out most of Wikipedia has been edited by like 1,500 dudes. And suddenly you're like, oh, so much makes sense to me now. <laughs> but it's the encyclopedia that anybody can edit, sort of. And there's levels of access that we don't really talk about that much because they mostly don't matter. But in situations like Open Library, in situations like our library, in situations like eBooks, who's got the passwords to do how much actually sort of matters a lot. The thing about digital content is there's always, almost always, going to be passwords involved. Someone's going to have passwords, but someone else is going to have root. Root meaning you can actually like get at the stuff underneath. So, you know, there's some people who have the keys to the library, is like my easy example. But y'all know who's got the keys to the library in most cases. Whether or not they're going to let you use it is a completely different question. But we sort of know that. But who's the case to Twitter? Like, I don't, I don't even know, right? Some dude. Uh, and, and how would you even find out? Send email to it? Have you ever tried to send email to Twitter for tech support? <laughs> I get responses from them like a month later. Like, oh, you just click this. And I'm like, number one, that didn't work. Number two, it's a month later. Like, that's not even tech support. It's just, I don't even know what that is. What's the word, like, you know, security theater is when you go through airports. There should be some like tech support theater where you pretend that you're being responsive, but you know, I'll try turning it off and turning it on again. It's, like, it's Twitter, it's all. That is not in my notes. Um, so the thing I like about the library best of all is that everybody's got the same level of access. There's us who are sort of behind the desk and users who are on the other side of the desk, but it's democratizing in more ways than just we know who has the keys and we don't have the keys. And the people who have access, the people with the keys, are answerable to more people than just the shareholders and just the free market, which I think is very good news. And their job is usually to increase that access to the extent that they can without letting you all live in the library. Although if anybody has a library that someone could live in, call me. That's like my next goal, my, my post-middle age, my, my midlife crisis goal. Is a library to live in and go live there. Um, so you don't get this, right? You don't have this verified super patron. Patrons are just patrons and people have to lump it. And of course some people don't like that and they're like, I'll just buy it at Amazon, whatever. So they can always come back when it turns out Amazon is not solving a problem for them and find a book from 40 years ago and we'll check it out to them and forget that they were ever mean to us. So this is especially important in sort of the world we're in where Buying books is pretty much as easy as stealing them in some ways. And by stealing, I don't mean like, I mean like going online and Googling the EPUB version of a thing and downloading it or torrenting it or whatever. We don't really talk about it that much. It's not that relevant to our business model. It's only important to understand the relative levels of hassle that people will have to get in to do a different thing. So stealing digital content is kind of this new thing. You know, and you don't have to agree with me ideologically. Everybody has sort of different feelings about it. But basically, when you steal digital content, there's also still digital content remaining. So it becomes this tricky issue. For a lot of people, it uh, eats into their business model. 
and that's a problem. And a problem I, I support being concerned about, but one of the reasons borrowing becomes complicated is because stealing is easy. So thinking about this, and buying things online is also kind of hard. So I have a book, and um, I stole it myself last weekend, which you wouldn't <laughs> think you could do, right? Because it belongs to me. But um, even though my contract said I would get a copy of the book in every format that was published, I did not get a copy of it in for the Kindle because they outsourced that to another company who would not literally give me a copy for free. <laughs> oh my God. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm telling you. But, but so I was just like, okay, if I wanted to steal my own book, how easy is that? And you know how easy it is? You type it into Google and you type PDF or Mobi or EPUB and you filter through a bunch of links that if I wasn't using a Mac would probably put spam and malware on my computer. But basically, eventually I found a downloadable version. Oh, Scripty, that website you were all talking about. <laughs> and 500 people have already downloaded it. Super. And, and I'm pretty mellow about the whole thing, right? I don't feel like, oh my god, my children are starving or whatever, my cat is starving. But it is worth understanding that this stuff is kind of simple, really simple. Um, and I would give you a link to this so that everybody could steal it, but because I'm an adult lady, I actually told my publisher, they sent a DMCA notice, and Scrippy, who actually is trying to do the Google thing, like, we're going to pretend we're not just a hotbed of copyright violations and follow the DMCA when we have to, and so they've taken it down by now, which was <coughs> interesting. Um, and so a lot of people don't go legit because it's easier to steal than to borrow, which is embarrassing and I wish weren't true and it's not my fault and I know it's not your fault, but it is a thing that is worth knowing as true regardless of whose fault it is. Um, I think borrowing digital content is difficult. Um, borrowing it from my own library is difficult and I don't have any secret superpowers to make borrowing it easier. Like people email at Open Library a lot and they're like, Look, man, I know that the book is checked out, but can't you, like, sneak me a copy? I've got a paper. I'm like, I literally can't. Like, I literally, that, it does not exist. <clears throat> and then I'm that jerk who says, I'm sorry, the computer won't let you. <laughs> because normally I'm like, the heck with it. We'll make the computer give up what it doesn't want to give us. But in the case of digital rights management, I literally don't know where that e-content is when it's checked out. Um, and I'm about as bright as they get with this kind of stuff. So it's frustrating. But, you know, they also know that I would give stuff away when I wasn't allowed to, and that's why one of the reasons that's true. So uh, I also tried to borrow my book last weekend because uh, I wanted to borrow. It's available through Overdrive, and um, I have a long-standing personal animosity towards Overdrive. And all the people who work there are lovely, and the websites they build are unusable. And, and whatever. I don't know why this is true, um, but... Um, but it's true, and so I was just like, I'm going to go borrow my book through Overdrive. That's going to be hilarious. I'll videotape myself trying to do it as I have an aneurysm. But um, <laughs> it actually turns out, this is the Green Mountain Library Consortium, who's our e-content people. Um, but aside from one really small error, e-act not ready, I don't know what that means, but you know what, I can type it into Google and figure out what it means in like two seconds. Um, it actually went well. The one-click stuff Overdrive's got going on, Wow, it really makes a lot of their stuff a lot better. I feel like if I wait another 20 years, this stuff is going to be dynamite. <laughs> but as I said before, I'm excitable and who's got time. Um, but I did get to check out my book and, and read it, and then I spent all weekend trying to hack it so I wouldn't have to return it. Uh, maybe successful. I mean, I've got four copies of it on the shelf, so I'm like an idiot. Just <laughs> so, uh, and my other favorite diagram uh, about e-lending is this one, which my friend um, John made. He works down in uh, Jacksonville, Florida, and was just, he started out trying to make something helpful for patrons. <laughs> and by the end of the day, he was like, I should just kill myself. <laughs> but it, it starts up at the top, and it basically is like, you know, I want to get a book from Overdrive. Can you read it in a browser? What kind of computer do you have? Do you have wireless? Do you have a Kindle? Did anybody other than Penguin publish it? Um, do you prefer reading in the Kindle app? Who knows? What's a Kindle? Uh, who published the book? Do you have the app? Is it easy? At any rate, we all laugh. But like, 
come on. Like, <laughs> I just want to like do a dramatic reading of this the next time I'm having a publisher debate and being like, do you think this is appropriate? Let's work together. Because I don't think they like it either. I don't think Overdrive enjoys it. They're nice people and they want to help us lend stuff, but they have to completing priorities, which is us and the publishers, and the publishers have some wobbly ideas about stealing content uh, you know, out of the mouths of babes, and we have to find ways to make this more legit, which is why every time I've been to open library and I'm like, it's kind of like stealing, but to heck with it, it's because this alternative is horrible. And I feel like it makes me look like a chump, and I'm very concerned about my image, which is why I became a librarian. <laughs> so, and then stealing is even complicated, because it's in a legal gray area. It's not particularly effective. Um, you know, some books you can find, but if I want to read some fun book from 1995, like, you can steal the Golden Compass. Maybe, I know that, but I mean, if you wanted to steal a book from 20 years ago that wasn't super popular at the time, you actually can't do that. It's another thing that like ebook long tail is really good for. And you might get crud on your computer because you're going to all these totally sketchy websites, which I feel comfortable navigating, but I would never tell a patron. Like, no, you just go to this website in Russia. No, it's okay. No, just make sure you don't buy anything. No, your computer doesn't have a virus. I'm pretty sure. And it's, it's a terrible situation. What we want is to be able to share things with a lower hassle factor. And the thing is, honestly, like we're the people. We're the people who should be doing this. We understand the systems. We speak people's languages on both sides. I can talk to publishers. And not disrespectfully, like, okay, I totally get where you're coming from, but come on, let's find a way. Maybe that's a little disrespectful. <laughs> and we're understanding more and more that we're empowered by the legal environment. Like, how great is that? That's so exciting. And the cultural shift is really going our way for a change. Um, it's funny how uh, having a librarian in the White House didn't actually help that as much as just having a lot of these lawsuits finally percolate, percolate up to where they're supposed to be. So uh, I was going to give you the link to my book, but uh, actually the system works, and when we complained to Scribby, they took the book down. And that's all I personally as an author care about. I'm like, oh, come on, quit it. Uh, I, you know, I probably lost $4. It just doesn't matter to me. And maybe that's my privilege talking, but still it's $4. So, um, now the other problem according to the ARL um, are this problem. Insecurity, staff are nervous, fair use with help, but we don't use it enough. And my favorite, risk aversion substituted for fair use analysis. Um, so this is from the ARL's Code of Best Practices. Anyone who's really interested in this, it's very readable, helpful. One of the things they use their grant money for is making a great website. I mean, all these slides are Creative Commons. You can just take them and use them in your own institution. And, it, and it's real common sense. One of the most important points they made was just the existence of a best practices for your type of institution. You know, fair use for dancers, fair use for marmosets, fair use for whatever. The existence of a best practices is in and of itself a shield against lawsuits because people assume you're actually trying, because it's a good faith effort to show that you're trying to stay on the right side of it. As opposed to just, I stole it because I wanted it. You're like, no, we have best practices and these have been checked out by lawyers and we follow them. So you're welcome to try and sue us, but I don't think it's gonna go your way. I just would like to save you the time and the heartache of losing, you know, your fair use attack on a tiny public library, um, that kind of thing. So just having best practices helps keep you safe. The other thing that keeps you safe is never doing anything. And so that's what we're trying to kind of work on. And so um, what we like to call this in, in sort of the tech world is a, a wetware problem is you know, the, the human non-typey, non-bits and bytes part. Uh, or as we like to say on Metafilter, uh, you're trying to apply a technological solution for a social problem, or uh, we sum it up like, sounds like a personal problem. When people are like, I hate how Metafilter does this and you need to build a tool that does the thing because I don't like whatever. 
reading the word, reading what these people say. I don't like it when people want to talk about guns. Um, we're like, well, it's a personal problem. Like, go for a walk. And, and that's not always right. I mean, I think we use tools a lot to help us do the things we want. But if the thing, if the thing has to do with your own sort of personal uh, emotional makeup, sometimes you just need to work on that. And part of the fair use thing that I'm here to talk about and that I think other people should be talking to other people about is working on risk aversion, working on the think of the children things. And I think this is hard, particularly in places like the Midwest, where you know you're going to have a bunch of people who maybe don't agree with some of your more intellectual freedom-oriented things. I mean, it's true in Vermont, too, but there's just not that many people in Vermont. So like the person who's arguing, like, the kids shouldn't read this, is also the one who you helped get their truck out of the ditch when they went off the road of the ice. And so you can usually hug it out in a way that maybe you can't in a much larger. <laughs> Have you not tried hugging it out? <laughs> All right, or the last thing we call this is uh, PEBCAC. Problem exists between keyboard and chair. <laughs> but you can then say it around people and they don't know you're talking about that. So like, I love this whole story about how the librarian fought with Overdrive and oh, by the way, we own that stuff. And Overdrive is like, we thought no one read the fine print. <laughs> and hooray, hooray, hooray. Because this is really important because if you're having budget problems, this is a whole bunch more content you actually have. And that's like a really big deal, not just a little deal. And part of this is just stepping up and being like, I know it's unpopular, but I, I think that stuff is ours. And there was the argument, and then uh, they have a whole bunch of other people. Library Journal had this adorable, is anybody in this picture in this room? Nice work, nice work. <laughs> Every time I tell people I'm coming to Kansas, they're like, ooh, 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 Kansas, how do you, you know, Midwest flyover? I'm like, dude, are you serious? I love it here. Because they're doing all this stuff. This page on Facebook, um, which the state library does, is one of the best places to find out what's going on with ebooks and libraries. Like, it's a doofy Facebook page, but it's updated and it talks about what's going on. And there's not that many states that kind of grok this at a state level so that that can trickle down to the other people. And it's really, it's like four people in the state library being like, this is important. So, and it's a lot more than my state does, which I can speak to you freely because I'm very far away from my state. <laughs> <laughs> I love Vermont generally, but I still think they feel like e-content isn't real content, and they're tired of having lunch with me to talk about how it is. <laughs> um, so, uh, Wrapping, wrapping up, or winding down a little bit. Uh, you know, we're on this planet where Amazon bought Goodreads. That was kind of a bummer. Uh, Elsevier bought Mendeley. You guys sort of on top of that. It was really interesting because I don't know if you guys read all the other nerds on the internet, but like Dana Boyd did a thing where she stepped down. She's a uh, blogger that talks a lot about social issues, digital divide issues. She's amazing. And she just left Mendeley because she's like, I just, like, nothing personal, Mendeley. You guys are awesome. But, like, how's it get a bunch of monsters to the sharing public? Like, they're a business. They're a very effective business. I have a friend who works there. We, we get along. But, like, she's like, I can't even be, I, I can't. Like, I, I have to go do my thing. And doing my thing means not being, like, drinking the, the Kool-Aid of Elsevier in order to be able to make those um, trade-offs that you have to. Uh, Random House bought Penguin. Exciting. I have a friend who worked for Penguin. She's like, every day we just feel like we're going to come in and everybody's going to be fired. And it hasn't happened, and I think it's probably going to be okay. And librarians, we just uh, buy an aspirin sounded a little bit more mellow than what we actually do, which is drink heavily. <laughs> <laughs> um, but when your data's uncertain, when you toss it online, and everything seems like it's stuck behind layers of hassle and authentication, and like, I'm as game as the next person, but I may not have 20 minutes to dig through digital nonsense in order to be <coughs> able to get to a thing. Like, I was hoping to use those 20 minutes to read. Um, and so there's authentication and ununderstandable rights. I don't understand a lot of the I err on the side of, I'm pretty sure I can use this, but one of these days, I'm gonna wind up in trouble, you know? And, and I'm okay with that, but it's easy for me because I work at a teeny public library. I would not maybe be doing that. And, and if my teeny public library gets in trouble, my town gets in trouble. 
And if my town gets in trouble, the next time I go off the road into a ditch, nobody's taking me out. <laughs> like, this is not about going to jail. It's about sort of dealing with your community realistically, and I can totally see why people are more risk averse. Like, I totally don't mean to be like, so just say F them and, you know, whatever. But you do have to sort of think about um, progress within sort of the, the tolerances of what the law allows, and the law now allows more. And so having these uh, assertive, and you know, Open Library, they have lawyers, and they're happy to do some of this fight for us, which makes me really happy. And you can get proxy URLs that point at content that goes from their catalog so that you can single click lend their ebooks. Um, but our role to play winds up advocating not just for fair use for patrons, obviously, um, but uh, assertive and possibly aggressing, aggressive sharing of some of the cultural content that we do have. I feel like it's risky. Everybody's going to have to make their decisions in sort of different ways. But I think it's also rewarding. And you know, in the world of tech, we call this kind of stuff, until it launched Friday, Thursday, vaporware. Like, everybody talks a good game. But what we want is like, show me the stuff. Show me the content. Show me how easy it is. And let me see if my grandma can actually get online and access this content, too. Because that timeline thing that DPLA has, which is lovely, involves like these micro movements and like I got a shaky hand and I'm in my 40s you know how does the shaky hand brigade use this how does the I don't see it very well brigade use this we're all going to the shaky hand I don't see very well brigade but these websites should work for us basically so I like the DPLA as a project and I like the people involved with it but I get a little itchy when people call it a library um, Open library, I love open library to death, but I get a little itchy about it being called a library. Even though now they have paperwork in the state of California that says they're legally a library, whatever that means. Um, and I love working there, don't get me wrong. Is it a library? Is, it, is the ghost ship of ebooks a library? I don't know. Um, these things, these damn things. People, everybody knows like the little libraries. They're adorable, and I love them, right? But people email me because they Google library and they find my website, and they're like, care to comment on? I'm like, it's a bookshelf. It's an outdoor bookshelf. <laughs> <laughs> tell me why it's a library, and I'll tell you why you're talking to a librarian. I love the project, and I don't mean to sound like one of those grouchy internet people. It's not a library, unless your library's running it and does like, you know, weeding and, and, and content development. And, oh, maybe you go and take the books out and do a little puppet show in there. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bookshelf with a roof, right? And I think the big deal is our libraries are not bookshelves with roofs. They've got us in them. They've got programs in them. They've got e-content. And all this stuff belongs to everyone, which I think has value. Like, I'm happy that Burning Man is kind of like Right? It's like the community, you just bring stuff and give it away. Gift economy. <coughs> Terrific. And, and it's fun. It's really fun to go there. But gift economy is different from community supported <coughs> cultural institution economy. And so, uh, basically, just totally wrapping up. I love this picture, but I just, I feel like such a crabby person. But in a world where access to knowledge is more and more defined by not just who has access, but how they get access. At the end of the day, someone has root, like I said before. And for us, who are inside the bookshelves with roofs and do all the other stuff, it's not just so much enough anymore that we know all the passwords, as much as that is kind of cool, um, but that we actually are the passwords, helping people getting from those places to those other places. So open them up. Thank you very much, and uh, time for lunch.